Well, thank you, Quinn. Thank you all, especially those who are enduring a second hour here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and some snowflake, or I mean the Arizona people and whatnot who felt obligated, I think, right, Joe? No, okay. <laughs> but wonderful to be here. Um, let me just tell you a little about my own background and, and uh, schooling and then talk about uh, career and why we pointed this direction and, and then do most of it Q&A. But uh, as, as you know, as I was heard before, I, I grew up in Snowflake. Um, my uh, great-great-grandfather founded the town and Rasta Snow came along and thus the name, which always uh, was a novelty in, in politics. People would laugh at it. I grew up not knowing that flake was a pejorative term. Nobody made fun of us in Snowflake. But then <laughs> when, I w when I went to do my internship, I'll jump ahead for a minute, um, there I was at a, a, a reception and we didn't, didn't have name tags. And somebody came up and uh, they heard that I was from Snowflake. They didn't know my name was Flake. This person knew somebody from Snowflake. I don't know how. And so, but they couldn't remember the name. And so this person struggled for the longest time and finally, I thought, well, I'll narrow it down a bit. I said, was this guy a flake? And uh, <laughs> he thought for me, he said, no, nah, he seemed pretty normal to me. <laughs> no. Anyway, I've never asked again, <laughs> something like that. But uh, some people say that I, anyway, I, I went to where there are other flakes and that's Congress. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that, uh, but, uh, but in Snowflake, my father was uh, the mayor for a while. That kind of came by rotation. Uh, my uncles were involved in school boards and irrigation districts and any elected office that came with being from a small town or any appointed office. My dad later served as uh, president of the parks board and on the governor's selection committee on judges and, uh, and just gave a great example of public service. I got that also from my uncle Jake Flake from Snowflake, who was the Speaker of the House in Arizona. There's a name, a political name for you. Uh, but I didn't grow up uh, thinking that uh, I would go into elected office. I just knew that I enjoyed arguing about politics with 10 brothers and sisters. You get some good debates going around the, the dinner table. And, and I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed uh, um, uh, you know, discussing these issues and certainly admired my father and, and uncles for what they were doing. But, uh, but it wasn't until I, I received a mission call to South Africa and Zimbabwe that uh, I, I got interested in African politics while I was there. I, I enjoyed my time. I learned the language of Afrikaans, which not many other places to speak it, but, uh, but it was a novelty when I, when I got back. Um, and I enjoyed uh, the different politics in Zimbabwe, in South Africa. South Africa at that time was still in the throes of apartheid, uh, racial segregation, terrible system that was still in place until years after I came home. When Cheryl and I, uh, jump ahead, uh, were in Namibia, there is when Nelson Mandela was released and things began to change. So we watched and witnessed up close that, that uh, transformation. But after my mission, I got home and uh, through my, uh, well, I, I didn't even get home from the airport Airport before my brother said, hey, you wanna go to Hawaii? <laughs> and uh, I hadn't given much thought of where I'd go to school. At that time, it was easy to apply, and, and three weeks later, we were at uh, BYU Hawaii, and I met my wife on the first day on the beach. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, been bliss ever since. Ever <laughs> right? but, uh, but anyway, uh, I took a political science uh, course or two in Hawaii, enjo enjoyed it, and, and uh, Cheryl was really encouraging, uh, I have to say, to say, you know, do what you love. And so when we got here to Provo, um, we were just actually walking around earlier and Cheryl said, I remember when we got back from Hawaii, this exact spot, I slipped on the ice <laughs> and thought, why are we here <laughs> instead of Hawaii? <laughs> I remember that sensation many times that, uh, that next semester. Uh, but we uh, stayed for a, a bachelor's in international relations and then a master's in political science. And at the end of the, the degree in political science, we decided to go and do an internship. And we worked it out so I could finish my degree there with the internship and just stay there. We were extremely naive about 
the cost of being there. I thought, hey, I've got an advanced degree. Jobs will be easy to come by. <laughs> Let's go to Washington. <laughs> so we loaded up our, our old car, 15-year-old car, and pulled a trailer with all of our belongings. We had about $1,500 to our name. We thought we were doing well, living large. I was going out for an unpaid internship on Capitol Hill. And uh, I had Cheryl uh, just uh, two months earlier. Uh, we'd, we'd been married about a year and a half or two years. Cheryl announced that she was pregnant. And uh, so morning sickness was starting in as we traveled out of here on the 1st of May, I believe. And a late snowstorm came. And I just remember climbing Parley Summit in our old car headed toward Washington and the snow was coming, there was some on the ground, and Cheryl was getting sick. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, she said, you gotta pull over, you gotta pull over. And I said, I can't or we'll slide down the mountain. <laughs> and so Cheryl rolls down the window and hangs her head out in a blizzard and, uh, <laughs> and did what she had to do. And, and she pulled her head back in and she had icicles on her eyebrows and, <laughs> and her hair was all back and she said, it better not get any worse than this. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to say, it hasn't. That was the, probably the low point, right? <laughs> so, but we got to Washington. Cheryl promptly got a job on Capitol Hill, so she was earning a paycheck. Uh, I was doing an unpaid internship, and uh, we enjoyed that. Um, we uh, decided later that we'd, we'd just uh, do what we planned to do, and we would find a job. And I fortunately, uh, downtown, there was a a firm that had some clients, a public affairs firm, clients in Southern Africa. Um, this was a, a two older gentlemen who had an account with the transitional government in Namibia, uh, some of whose members were Afrikaans speakers. And they thought, wouldn't it be novel, wouldn't it be neat uh, for us to have uh, somebody, an employee who could speak Afrikaans. And so I got my first job, really, because I could speak Afrikaans. And not that it was really needed for the job, but it was, uh, like I said, it was a novelty. Um, we were with that firm for two years and then kind of went to uh, Namibia with the client in a way and spent a year there as Namibia became independent from South Africa. It was a one-year process governed by the United Nations. Resolution 435 was implemented. And for a political junkie, that was nirvana, to be there when a country has its first elections and writes its constitution. And so I was completely hooked uh, on politics by that time. I had uh, written my master thesis on Zimbabwe and its transition uh, to, to, or, uh, from independence and where it went from there. And so uh, we, uh, we really enjoyed that time in Namibia, came back here, or I'm uh, sorry, to Washington for a year or two and then went uh, to Arizona. And then I was hired uh, at the Goldwater Institute, a, a think tank. And there are, let me just tell you, there are so many more options to you today than there were when I first got out of college. Uh, so many think tanks and advocacy organizations and others that you can work for. It's easier. You can do it more remotely than you could before if you have the skills, if you can write, if you can write persuasively, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but, uh, but, but that was a, a wonderful job for seven years. I ran a think tank as it grew from just one employee, me, uh, to uh, several scholars. And we were sitting pretty nicely until uh, there was an open seat in Congress. And we hadn't planned to run at really any time. We knew that we wanted to be around politics, but to be an elected official really wasn't something that we had really considered. Um, and so, but no, open seats don't come around that often. Um, and so we decided to, to run, and uh, we got lucky the first time. So I, I went from a background in public policy at a think tank, uh, not having any real political experience, I'd never worked on a campaign or done that side of it, uh, into elected office. We were elected, as Gwen said, for uh, six terms in the House and then uh, uh, one term in the Senate, and we're just finishing that. But, uh, but I. I mentioned to some people we were just talking to, when I did my internship in Washington, uh, what I considered is I was just deep in policy. I wanted to do Africa policy. And there were two senators from Arizona, obviously, John McCain 
and at that time, Dennis D. Consini, John McCain, a Republican. I was a Republican. Dennis D. Consini, a Democrat. But uh, D. Consini was doing more foreign policy than John McCain was at that time. In particular, was more involved in what was called at that time the Reagan Doctrine in Africa, funding insurgent movements to push back on communism. And I was interested in, in uh, that aspect, and so I thought I'll, I'll work for Deacon Sini. That wouldn't, probably wouldn't happen today. Uh, you, you probably, um, if I were to offer career advice, I guess, you may want to, to, and it shouldn't be this way perhaps, but people will, will think, well, am I gonna go into Republican politics and go work for a Democrat? Um, it was difficult enough trying to work for the think tank afterwards when most of the board members said, you're gonna run a conservative think tank when you work for a Democrat. How's that gonna happen? Uh, fortunately, they, they saw through that, but, uh, but perhaps maybe less forgiving today um, in the polarized politics that we have. But, um, but that's something you, you may want to consider. Um, as far as, as skills that you need, I wish that I would have taken more econ courses uh, that would have been useful. I didn't necessarily want to take the courses. I just would have liked to have the knowledge <laughs> that comes. <laughs> and so I'm not sure I was willing to subject myself. I certainly wasn't at that time. But, uh, but I, uh, looking back, uh, that's what I think would have been useful in my career before I got to Congress and also in Congress as well. One thing that I did uh, learn how to do, I, I I couldn't stand it at the time. Political Science 200, is it still the bear that uh, it always was? <laughs> it was good. <laughs> I'm glad others are subjected to it. Uh, my, uh, the professor was Stan Turley at the time, way back when. Taylor, Taylor I'm sorry, Stan Taylor. And uh, I had his, his son was a missionary companion of mine before. I thought that would get me something. Nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. Uh, but that class was, uh, was a great class for what I needed later. Um, it taught me to be precise and uh, to be detailed, and it's drilled into you. And most of our time uh, here was before computers were in full use. It was still me taking something and having Cheryl type it at home. But I, I will admit that now. I'll never admit that later, but or I wouldn't have before. But but, uh, but anyway, that class was, was a good one. I, I can tell you um, it was a huge benefit to be able to write uh, persuasively. And as an employer, uh, when I got to the House and the Senate, I would say the most difficult uh, uh, type of employee to find is somebody who can write and write well and write grammatically correct and write persuasively. So the ability to write is a big one. And uh, whatever you can do to increase your, um, increase your, your skills there uh, would be useful. But with that, we'll throw it open to questions uh, from anybody and go from there. Yes? Close to the microphone. Sorry. Right up here on the side. Right here. And you can form a queue if you want for, for questions. They're kind of seated around. Um, so in my, I suppose, like preparation for coming here and, you know, um, learning more about you and your, um, I suppose, your actions and what you've done in the past, I was really impressed by, um, it appeared, the, the distinct and concurrent, I suppose, dedication from you in your, I suppose, you know, be, being willing to go against, I, guess, I suppose, like the norm of a party. Um, in order to, I suppose, get in what your opinion was the, the, the morally correct thing to do. Um, I, I saw that uh, to come to pass. I saw that going throughout your, mm -hmm. your voting history and um, uh, throughout your interactions with other senators and political parties. Um, so I suppose my question would be from you, in your opinion, what is the best way to bridge that gap where, you know, you, you definitely don't want to go completely against the norms of a party or a group that you're affiliated with, but if you feel as though that there's, you know, a higher law to, to protect, what, what do you do there? That's a great question. Um, that is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when you're in the House, and, and people often ask the question, 
uh, when you go to Washington, are you there as a representative or a delegate? The old Political Science 101 question. Are you there to uh, express the will of your constituents or your own conscience? I decidedly believe in the latter. Um, now, in the House, when you're elected every two years, you can't get too far from what your constituents want <laughs> or where they are, or you won't be in Congress anymore. In the Senate, you have a little more leeway with a six-year term. Uh, but the last thing uh, you want to do is you know, test the wind uh, whenever any, ever any big issue comes up. You, it just, uh, there are some who do that. There are some who are there just to be reelected or just to mark time. Mm -hmm. And if that's your goal, uh, more power to you. <laughs> but uh, but uh, there are, to be in elected office in the House and Senate, particularly now in this day and age of you know, pretty tough times in terms of the scrutiny that comes. There are a lot of perks, and it is heady to be there. It's wonderful to be in the arena. But in my view, uh, there are also a lot of sacrifices in the family's view that, that your, your family will undergo. You miss a lot of kids' games and activities. You, you know, you're traveling a lot. You're spending thousands and thousands of hours on a plane you're getting beat up in the media um, and, uh, and elsewhere. And my view has always been if, you, if you're just there to mark time, to collect a paycheck or to enjoy the perks, it's not worth it. Um, you have to be driven that you're accomplishing something. You're, you're moving the country in a direction you think the country ought to be, to, uh, be in, moving the party or a movement in a way that you think it should go. Um, and you, you have to feel that drive um, or it's just not worth it. And now, to what extent should you be willing to bend your philosophy or whatever to stay in office? They always say, well, you can't affect good unless you're in office. That is true. And everybody modulates and emphasizes something different, I guess, during a campaign. That's, that's politics. But I can just say in this last go around for me, uh, to win re-election would have required me to adopt positions that I just can't adopt and condone behavior I couldn't condone. And, and so at some point, you might reach a point where you say, I just can't do it. And that's the point I came to. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, my name's Elizabeth Watcott, and I'm planning to go on the Washington seminar. And Good for you. Yeah, and it'll be my last semester as an undergrad, and so I am also naively hoping that I can live in D.C. at not too much of a cost. So <laughs> um, I guess what would be your, like, do's and, like, top two maybe do's and don'ts of life as a young, hopeful professional in Washington, D.C.? While you're doing your internship, or, or both, after? any uh, anything. <laughs> well, I would say, I, I mean, I I love the Washington Seminar Program, and I mean, there are a lot of colleges that have uh, universities that have programs. I don't know that they're any better than Washington intern or the Washington Seminar, because of the facilities there, the faculty that's there, the opportunities and the structure that they give. It's it's a great program. It really is. Uh, but my advice would be when you're there doing that. Uh, Take every opportunity you can to network, to, to meet other people, not just those in the Washington Seminar Program with you, uh, but if there are you know, receptions you can go to, events, hearings, um, you know, take advantage uh, of, of all of it. Um, getting your first job in Washington is all about networking. <laughs> it's all about uh, knowing people who know people uh, who've talked to people who know about an opening <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and, and, and to be willing as well and, and in a position to be able to take a position that may not pay well. <laughs> It'll be tough to scrape by for a while, but know that, uh, you know, that you know, there has to be an entry point at some point. And to also leave your pride at the door. <laughs> um, you know, you may have an advanced degree, as I did when I went there, you quickly find out those are a dime a dozen. Uh, a lot of people with advanced degrees, a lot of people with good background knowledge, a lot of people with language skills, um, and to, to realize that uh, 
that you know there are a lot of people competing and, and don't think just because you have a certain background that you're going to be a shoe in you've got to work and uh, and then also I mean be uh, one thing that uh, I wouldn't have had to give this advice you know, years ago, but certainly today. Um, be careful about what you post, what you like, um, your presence on social media. Uh, be careful about that. Um, I, I think being members of the church, we already have kind of guardrails and parameters that others perhaps may not have in terms of pictures that are taken or things like this, but be cognizant that uh, every employer, whether they admit it or not, uh, will, will look at that kind of thing. And, and be careful if you're looking down the road to run for office as well, be careful about what you post in terms of not something scandalous or whatever, but positions you take that are far out of the mainstream um, or are meant uh, either as devil's advocate or converse position, you, 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 it's not taken as such sometimes. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. Life is sometimes not fair, and you will be treated unfairly for some of those posts or, or whatever else. But, but recognize that. That's something that uh, is present today that really wasn't before. But I kind of went far afield from where you were. Is that that's all right? Great. Did I no, answer that's it okay? Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Flake, uh, I'm Jared Smith, political science major. Um, and uh, my question is from your lecture previous. Um, this was something that was kind of on my mind because uh, you, you were talking about stances that you were opposed to because of the, kind of the way the, you felt the party was going. So I was just curious, what are some effects that maybe you see President Trump having on the stance of the Republican Party and like also on the U.S.'s influence internationally? All right. Well, that was kind of, uh, I don't know how career advice <laughs> that is, or I mean, <laughs> but just to deviate for a minute, I, I, it's no secret that I am very concerned about where the party is going um, mm -hmm. and uh, the president's influence on the party. Mm -hmm. I think we have to uh, have, you know, play the game of addition rather than subtraction. And when you drill down on the base, you, know, you get a lot of excited people in the base, but uh, but you turn off the broader public. And, and I'm afraid that's what's happening if you look at the midterms that we just went through. And you look at some of the exit polling that's coming out. Uh, Republicans had a 12-point advantage among independents in 2014 in the midterms then. That's now a 12-point disadvantage. And the game is played with those in the middle and independents. Um, we had a, a four-point disadvantage among women. That's now a 19-point disadvantage. And uh, so it, it, we really, Republican Party can't win statewide elections or national elections if we continue to play subtraction rather than addition. So mm -hmm. those, are, those are my concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, Senator Flake. My name is Emily Parker, and actually, my parents also met the first day at BYU Hawaii. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. They did. <laughs> they did. Uh huh. Well, there's a funny story, but kind of. <laughs> anyway, well, I was ours was a little longer than that. We dated a bit, and then she dumped me. I mean, just, <laughs> just, just she, she doesn't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, actually, that's my new question. <laughs> but, I, but I groveled later, and, uh, you know, it, it ended okay. But, Good. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I wanted to know, do you still see the hand of God in politics and government, or is that, is it gone? <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I have, in, in my own case, uh, you know, people will say that, you know, they were, some people had a dream or were, felt that, you know, they were called to, to do this. I've never wanted to claim that, and I don't claim that uh, at all. I, I think, uh, you know, for those of us who, who are members of the church, we know that God will accomplish his designs. Um, you know, as he sees fit, and uh, and I uh, I would be wary of uh, of those who point at specific people and say, you know, they're there for this reason or that reason. I mean, to be a little careful about that. I've never claimed that about myself, but I, I do think, 
and we know as members of the church we believe that uh, that certainly uh, the, the Constitution we have and uh, the system of government uh, 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 had to be conducive for the restoration of the gospel and uh, I, I think uh, further for the you know, teaching of the gospel around the world, there's still a lot that needs to happen. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, I certainly think the hand of the Lord is evident, um, but I, I'm not trying to claim it's, uh, it's pointed me in any direction. I wouldn't want to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah Reed, an international relations major. Um, with your interest in African politics and then being in American politics, are you still able to do what you want internationally, or have you found that you've been much more interested in American politics? Well, obviously, I can't run for office in Africa, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I, what's been wonderful is to be involved um, in, in issues. I've chaired the Africa Subcommittee for the past couple of years. I've served on the Africa Subcommittee my entire time uh, in the House and the Senate. And I've been able to travel to Africa uh, multiple, multiple times. Uh, and uh, to, I wrote my <coughs> master's thesis on Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. I was later able to sit down with Robert Mugabe for a four-hour dinner and discuss my master's thesis a little bit <laughs> with him. It was not something I asked for, actually. I didn't, didn't know I wanted to meet with him, but it came anyway. Um, and to meet with, uh, um, you know, Presidents and you know Cheryl and I know the president of Namibia. We knew him in 1990 when we were there. He's still or is now again the president of Namibia, and uh, to go there to pick up our son who is serving a mission there and have him meet with the president for the second time and meet with the president of Zim or, uh, Botswana and work on church visas for missionaries with them and do these kind of things has been really rewarding. Um, and to be able to pass legislation on democratic governance uh, in Zimbabwe, for example, to pass uh, wildlife preservation uh, and anti-poaching efforts uh, that we partner with governments in Southern Africa on, um, to work on programs uh, like PEPFAR that have done a world of good in terms of alleviating human suffering in Africa, but also have uh, led to uh, uh, much goodwill in terms of African countries toward the United States because of our assistance and Ebola and, and public health issues. So I, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed doing that and doing it as an American politician has been particularly rewarding. It's, uh, uh, Africa has 54 countries and varied interests and uh, something's always, always going on in one of them <laughs> that causes a concern. And one thing that's been nice as well is uh, when you're in the Senate, um, one responsibility the Senate has that the House doesn't is to improve the pre approve the president's ambassadors. Um, and so with Africa, with 54 countries, every week we were interviewing and processing and having hearings for ambassadors going to, to Africa and, and to be able to learn more about uh, the countries and, uh, and what their needs are has been really rewarding and we'll continue our involvement, Sh Cheryl and me. Um, in Africa going forward. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Jenny Baker, and I'm a political science major. Um, many people believe that power um, does corrupt. Um, if you believe that, how have you navigated um, having a position of power and avoiding corruption, and what would your advice be for us wanting to get into politics? Well, well thank you. Yeah, it's Lord Acton's maxim: <laughs> power corrupts, and ab power or absolute power <laughs> corrupts absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a, a vacation you see it all over the world. Fortunately, in our system of government, we have checks and balances, and uh, some of those are being questioned <laughs> some now. And uh, I've, I, I've, I think that as members of Congress, uh, we've certainly given far too much authority. Uh, to the executive branch, over the years, the, the trend just goes that way automatically. Uh, my problem is that we've given too much up voluntarily, um, like the decisions uh, to go to war um, or to, uh, 
to use military force. That's something that Congress should be involved in. And uh, somebody in the President's position could, could abuse, could misuse uh, without Congress stepping in. So, but as far as an individual uh, member of, of Congress um, exercising, uh, you know, power that corrupts, it's a little difficult in a legislative body, gratefully, uh, because you have uh, others that you need to persuade, and uh, as well as your constituents every couple of years. So, Thank thanks. You. Hi, my name is Dan Harker. Um, I'm a Middle East Studies Arabic major. And um, I, I feel like kind of like young people involved in politics right now, we have two competing impulses. So the impulse to defend truth and to stand up for facts and also the impulse to see the two sides of every issue and to be bipartisan and to be right. inclusive of all perspectives. And I guess in your experience, what's the best way to navigate kind of that fine line between standing up for what you know or think to be right while at the same time being open to debate Great. and open to bipartisanship. Well, thank you, thank you. I gave a speech on that in, uh, in February on that topic, uh, truth. Um, and it, it is a problem. I, I think what we've had in this country ever since its founding is some sense of shared facts and shared values. And uh, when you have, in, in my case, I've been concerned with the administration's uh, um, I guess careless nature about truth, <laughs> and uh, it it uh, it really does impact a democracy going forward. You have to have shared shared facts. One thing that I would uh, encourage, and I say often in forums like this, but for people my age, I tell them, change the channel. <laughs> Whatever you're watching, whether it's Fox all day or MSNBC or CNN, change the channel realize that not everyone feels the way that these particular anchors or, or people on the show or those watching feel. If it's people your age who don't watch much television, it's get out of your news feed. <laughs> Make sure that you, you don't just uh, rely on algorithms that feed information to you that you already agree with. You don't want to drink your own bathwater. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and realize, uh, and at your age in particular, you have something that uh, people my age only dreamed of in college. We had to go out and get hard copy of the New York Times or go to the library and look at microfilm or microfiche or whatever else to do research. Now it's all there with the click of a button, uh, but that hasn't necessarily led people to have more informed views. It's, it's simply, put them in silos or bubbles often, and, and we see that, and that's, I think, led to a lot of the polarization that we see today. So that's one thing that I would really advise is to, is to make sure that you know that not everyone feels the same way you do or the class that you're taking, the people around you, and, and expose yourself to different opinions politically. And not to say you change your position, but be informed and to be tolerant of other people's opinions. Thank you. You bet. My name's Audrey Stacy. I'm a political science major and an environmental science minor. And my question is kind of along the lines of you've talked about um, having sometimes personal opinions that aren't totally popular within your party. Right. And I've seen some of your tweets about um, climate change or about carbon tax and issues like that. And I, I wanted to know for like young Republicans interested in environmental law, what recommendations you have, especially considering what you've said about um, working for a Democrat and mm -hmm. having that later almost be a hiccup in your career? <laughs> well, great. Well, on the latter, I wouldn't change uh, who I worked for for <laughs> anything. And in fact, Dennis DeConcini, a Democrat, he contributed to all of my political campaigns and remains a good friend today. In fact, when he, uh, when I became a senator, uh, he left and Senator Kyle replaced him, then I replaced Senator Kyle, and Senator DeConcini would often come in to lobby me, his former intern. That was wonderful. <laughs> I could say, go sort my mail, you know. <laughs> Answer a few phones. <laughs> what goes around comes around here. <laughs> Not really. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, with regard to the environment, this is one issue that uh, millennials uh, uh, certainly feel differently than many 
uh, older people, millen millennial Republicans, have no question about uh, whether or not our climate is changing or the effects of global warming. Um, I'm, I've always felt that uh, we should be more aware, and I think the danger that we have as Republicans among women and minorities, uh, we have the same dangers among millennials uh, who are who have been walking away from the party for a while. I think now they're in a dead sprint um, because of the party's failure to address seriously some of these issues like climate change. I introduced the last bill I introduced in the Senate with no hope that it would get anywhere. I introduced it the day before I left, but I wanted that marker there. I wanted people to know that there was one Republican, at least, in the Senate who recognizes that climate change exists and we have to deal with it. I think the, the easiest way, or the most honest way, is through a revenue neutral carbon tax where we don't pick winners and losers among renewables. You just, uh, if you have a negative externality, you, you tax it, you want less of it. And that, that's where I feel. And people who say, well, Flake's gone liberal and, and <laughs> whatever else, uh, now he leaves the Senate, he introduces a carbon tax. I introduced almost the same bill eight years ago in the House of Representatives. And so I, I felt this way for a while. So, thanks. Thank My name is James. Uh, I just declared poli sci. Um, and so, kind of what someone else mentioned, you were into African politics and then you decided to come home and work in Arizona. Uh, what made you decide, with so many factions of government, you seem obviously to love Africa. Right. What made you decide to, to come back? Uh, family. <laughs> you know, we, we had lived uh, back east for uh, five years, with a year in Africa, and uh, wanted to get. Um, back west, um, t closer to family, and uh, you know, once you are raised in the west, it's tough to really settle anywhere else. So we wanted to come home. I certainly wanted to stay involved in Africa, but uh, one I needed to to uh, to find something that uh, obviously I could support my family with, um, uh, but also do something else I enjoyed. I'd, I'd done Africa policy for five years. And, wanted to change it up and do something else. And I really enjoyed my time at the Goldwater Institute. But, but all that time, I did long for foreign policy uh, to do more international relations again. And I, I never stopped uh, reading and studying um, and hoping that I'd go back to it somehow. And I, I, if I hadn't done this job, I'd always thought uh, the Foreign Service would be wonderful. and that. It's a great profession. It's tough on a family. And uh, I'm not sure that we could have uh, survived that. But, uh, but I think we've had the best of both worlds, being able to travel a lot. I meet with a lot of Foreign Service officers, a lot of, uh, you know, just about everywhere we go, um, there are LDS members of the Foreign Service in those particular countries. And in fact, we've rarely found one where we haven't found uh, uh, foreign service officers who are LDS, and so we've we've had kind of the benefits of, of both of them, being able to travel on the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, but be able to do other things as well. I have to say, uh, in a period of four months last year, kind of talking about the intersection of, of church and state, uh, we've been able to, uh, um, and Cheryl was with me most of this time, but I was able to attend uh, at least sacrament meeting in, well, Mesa, Arizona, Provo, Utah, uh, Washington, D.C., New York City, Havana, Cuba, Copenhagen, Denmark, Harare, Zimbabwe, Gaborone, Botswana, and Vintuk, Namibia, all in the space of about four months. And, uh, and that's been a wonderful benefit of this job, is to be able to see the growth of the church uh, worldwide and to be involved uh, in depth in, in Cuba in particular. So, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, my name's Isabel Williams. I'm a freshman poli sci major. And um, you've talked about the kind of unfortunate necessity of aligning yourself with a party um, when you decide to work in politics. And so I'm curious what advice you have 
for young people um, who may align with more traditional Republican values but don't feel comfortable registering with the party in its current state, but also aren't Democrats. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> no, no I, I should say that, that with what I'm talking about um, and this becoming an issue, it's, it's really only if you're, well, um, if you're going to work on a campaign for somebody who's uh, in elected office or you're going to run for elected office, there are far more jobs uh, overall uh, for people who uh, can register as an independent or as a quiet Republican or quiet Democrat uh, in the Foreign Service, for example, I was just talking about, or um, in, in some, um, maybe not a personal congressional office, but on a committee or, mm -hmm. or uh, at federal agencies, there are a number of jobs where you don't have to declare either way, uh, talking specifically of uh, working on campaigns or becoming an elected official. But I, I, I mean, I, I think there are, for, for somebody who is not ready to declare one way or another, be, being an independent um, doesn't, is not a strike against, uh, it's not seen that way. Um, so I, I, I would have no qualms about doing that. There are times when many of us think that, uh, you know, uh, can we, can we uh, continue this way or not? <laughs> so, uh, so, but I, I wouldn't have any qualms about that. Great, thank you so much. You bet. Hi, my name is uh, Stephen Torgerson. Um, so you talk a lot about bipartisanship, and um, I was in your lecture earlier, and, and you spoke about some of the, the ways that you've instituted that as a congressman. Um, but what are ways that we can encourage bipartisanship? Sometimes it seems, right, like do we vote for the other party, you know, our vote seems insignificant. Like, what are ways that we, as the citizens, as those who we represent, can encourage bipartisanship mm -hmm. in those we've elected? Oh, well, great. It's tough. It's particularly in a college environment when you want to be, you know, behind a party and enthusiastic and you want to get people to a rally or whatever else. You, you know, that kind of pushes you toward, you know, accepting and getting behind whatever, you know, the party or a person does. And, I understand that poll, and that's difficult to avoid. Um, but uh, one thing that, something that's m more recent phenomenon are some of the groups out there that kind of align with a party, particularly the Republican Party, who want to uh, um, get people excited by basically demeaning the other side. Uh, a phrase that comes up is owning the libs, you know. and. Uh, you see these groups that come to college campuses and and get people to to uh, I think use language that's just inappropriate and uh, I, just my advice would be to avoid that kind of vitriol and and to to understand and to make sure people understand that you understand that your political opponents are not your enemies <laughs> that uh, that they are well-meaning as well. And uh, so I, I think there are ways to, to certainly advance uh, individual candidates and causes without um, going too far. And certainly use of uh, profanity or to ridicule people or describe their appearance or whatever. There's just no place for that. And, uh, and I'd hope particularly at a university like BYU that uh, we avoid things like that. Thank so, you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Abraham Hendricks. I'm a Middle Eastern Studies and Arabic major and also a Russian major. Um, earlier this month, Senators Cruz and Rooney introduced a bill to establish term limits in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, my two questions on that would, how do you think that would affect um, the way that Congress operates in the future, and how would that have affected you in the past and your actions and things that you did and the way you okay. voted? Well, thank you. I, I thought during the 90s and when I ran for Congress the first time that term limits were a great idea. That was when that was really the kind of the fad of the time. And the Supreme Court came out and said, no, that's a constitutional issue. You have to have a constitutional amendment. So any of these efforts to introduce legislation, um, I, I don't see them going uh, very far. And, and frankly, I hope they don't. Um, I've uh, my view on that has changed. I. 
I and and partly because the politics has also changed. We we don't have an issue of of Congress in mass staying too long in a position uh, in the Senate. More than half of the hundred senators serving now are in their first eight years. Uh, so we've had massive turnover, which by and large has been a good thing. But you also lose something as well um, when you have a, a dysfunctional Congress like we've had for a while without regular order, without passing spending bills like we should. We, we've operated for years on continuing resolutions, just unable to, uh, to reach a conclusion. And the fact that we're in a government shutdown situation right now proves the point. The problem with having new people come every time is, or uh, every two years is they have no institutional knowledge of Congress when it worked. Mm -hmm. And when people retire, like Senator McCain passing on, Senator Hatch retiring, you're getting fewer and fewer people who actually were in Congress when it worked. And, and that's a problem. It really is. Now, I, the Senate has been pretty dysfunctional my entire time there. But I was in the House for 12 years before that, during times when we did have regular order. So I've, I've, I've seen it there, but uh, we're, we're quickly coming to a point where more people have never experienced regular order than have, and I think that has led to a lot of the dysfunction. You end up getting people who think that you can defund Obamacare on an appropriation bill or something like that when that's just not how the legislation works. And so I, I, I don't think that that's a particular good idea. Um, and, uh, and also, given the fact that we have the, uh, the presidency has amassed so much power over the years. Some is just kind of gravitational pull. Uh, but like I said, in other cases, it's when we've willingly just given up authority because we don't want the responsibility, mm -hmm. like the decision to declare war or things like that. So having people in the Congress who understand separation of powers and are, you know, and have some sense of history I think it's a benefit. Next slide. Thank you. I'm going to okay. exercise some prerogative and, and ask the last question. Okay. So, uh, and, and the question is, um, if you were giving advice to a student uh, intern or recent graduate about uh, getting employment on Capitol Hill or in Washington, D.C., earlier you said something about networking. And I want you to expand on that because uh, what my experience with students is is that the word networking is mysterious. Uh, they don't know that a lot of people say it, but but they don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. So it, to you, what does networking mean, and what does that mean to somebody that is seeking a first job in terms of making those connections? How do they do it? How do you mm -hmm. how do you network effectively? Well, uh, you know. People often ask, is it better to go to the House or the Senate to get more in-depth knowledge or meet more people with a smaller staff or where more people are churned through in the Senate? That's kind of your own choice. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. But by networking, I mean just take every opportunity while you're there to meet people, uh, to meet people not just those of your peers, uh, but those in other offices. If you have responsibility in an office that takes you to a hearing, you know, find out uh, who's chairing that hearing, who the ranking minority member is. Uh, is this a, 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 you know, if it's a foreign relations committee, would I like to work for this committee somehow? If so, uh, who, who's in charge? Wh who's the chief of staff of the ranking minority member or the, uh, the, the chairman of the committee? Um, are there people interning there? Can I talk to them? Um, is that somewhere I want to go after this position? Um, is, is, are there receptions going on? Um, are there lobbyists in town uh, for a particular, uh, you know, or advocates for a particular position or movement or a company? Are they having a reception going? Can I go to that one? I mean, there are opportunities like that all the time but you just got to get outside of your comfort zone sometimes and, uh, and, and also ask, if you're in an intern position, ask the legislative assistant or legislative correspondent or the office manager or whoever you're working with uh, to you know, say, 
I want to, you know, if there are hearings going on on this, I, I want to attend them. Or if they're, because let me tell you, interns, a lot of them churn through and you'll be doing the office manager or your direct supervisor a favor sometimes, or telling them what you're interested in and, and can you attend this hearing or, or uh, this markup or can I go to the floor or take this group? Um, I mean, if you, the more initiative you can, you can get, they like that. Let me push you a little further and say, what I hear when I talk to students about it is that students feel like networking's a little dirty, like it's, it's too transactional. Like you're just meeting somebody so that you can get them to give you a job or do something for you. How do you make it different than that? How do you make it so it doesn't feel like you're just using somebody to get what you want and, and instead it's, what is it then? <laughs> <laughs> That's a thin line. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I, I, I think you shouldn't apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you're you're students. Uh, you're looking to uh, take the next step, and uh, and I mean, uh, there are there are some movers or people who I guess it can go too far, but err on the side of going too far. Just go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. And I, I tell you, I like I said. You'll, if you're, you know, your direct supervisor, uh, sometimes it's, uh, oh no, another intern, we have to find things for them to do. Uh, sometimes that's the case, uh, depending on the office. Uh, you know, don't let it get to that. Say, hey, here's what I'd like to get out of this experience, um, and how can I do that? And if you ask them, um, you know, say, I, I really need your advice and counsel. <laughs> that people like to hear whether it's me or any of my staff, they, they want to hear that. And, uh, and they'll be willing to dispense that advice and, uh, and help you out. But take the initiative. Uh, but, but getting to know people, uh, getting to know the issues, um, and taking advantage of opportunities in, in the evenings or, or uh, you know, even during your work time, like I said, if you're particularly interested and your direct supervisor knows that you are They'll, uh, they'll help you out there, but they need to know of your interests that way. We're out of time. Please join me in thanking Senator Clay. Thank you.